Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, this is going to be a bit tough on you. It's early in the morning and it's going to be a bit complicated. Let me take you to northern France, uh, to the abbey of saint armand en pierre and here was made between 871 and 877 a splendid manuscript, the second Bible of Charles the Ball, of which this is the opening page for the book of Genesis. This manuscript is now in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, one of their very, very prized possessions. Here is a detail from this page, and absolutely splendid capital, beautiful capitals. Uh, they have been correctly identified as Carolinian capitals from the Carolinian period. It was Nicholas Gray who did this in a little known publication, uh, lettering as drawing, contour and silhouette. Small books, very nice, published in 1970. These capitals have been modeled on the classical Roman capitals, but they have been changed enough to justifiably be called Carolinian. This talk is partly paleographic, about letter forms in manuscripts, and partly epigraphic, about letter forms in inscriptions, and also, as you will see, about present day digital forms, letter forms. These Carolinian capitals can be seen in many manuscripts, but only in a few inscriptions. <coughs> this is Charles the Bald, for whom the book was made. We have, we can't see here whether he was really a bald. <laughs> <laughs> he was the king of West Francia, uh, a large part of what is now France. He was king of Italy and Holy Roman Emperor as Charles II. And this is a portrait of him from the Psalm of Charles the Bald, made before 861. <coughs> We now make a detour and go to the Abbey of Corvey in Germany. Here is, on the façade of the church, one of the rare inscriptions with Carolinian capitals. It's badly weathered, as you can see, and uh, the outdoor copy has been uh, brought in and has been replaced by uh, the copy. Here is a detail. The letters were inlaid with metal, with copper, which has disappeared long ago. And here you see some of the characteristics of the uh, Carolinian capitals. Look at the uh, curves of the uh, G and the D and the uh, short triangular serifs and the uh, way uh, the verticals uh, flare towards the end. That's all different from how the Romans did it. This inscription was made between 836 and 844, some 30 years before the second Bible of Charles the Bald was made. So we go back to this book, wherein most of the pages show the Carolinian minuscule as the script for the text. Here is a detail. <coughs> And what you see, uh, combined with the Carolinian lowercase, is a capital N, here at the uh, top, over there at the top. This is going to be difficult. <laughs> 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 and you see an uncial A underneath the N, and two uncial Qs, which look like uh, lowercase Q. And a U and a D, also uncials. And you'll hear more about uncials in a moment. 
The Carolinian minuscule, as you all know, was developed during the last quarter of the 8th century in northwestern France, then in the territory of the Franks. And the Franks were a Germanic tribe and one of the peoples that moved into northwestern Europe in the 3rd century of the Roman era. Charlemagne, the famous emperor, the founder of the uh, Carolingian Empire was a Frank, and Charles the Bald, you have just seen, was one of his grandsons. When you go through the manuscript and turn the pages, you come to page 99, and it's the Book of Kings. Here begins the Book of Kings, the first book. Kings, Liga Primo. And you see that the uh, Carolinian capitals have been combined with uh, big display letters in what is called the Franco Insular style. I'll come back to this Insular Irish, Celtic, and Anglo Saxon elements. And again, I will come back to this. But first, um, to read the text, Incitit uh, Regum Liga Primo. And then here, this is a large F and a U. Who with Phil Unos de Rana Time. Uh, here begins the book of Kings, and there came a man from Rana Time. And this detail I'm going to have a closer look at. Right in the middle. Between the elegant Carolingian caps, there is a totally different world. Um, what is it? It's fairly spectacular, I think. Here is a new closure. I like it very much, but where does it come from? The letters are worked into a pattern, and a third of these uh, fanciful letter forms is a half unsure U, which is this one here. Uh, uh, over there. <laughs> <laughs> and the fifth is an unsure B, this one, with the, uh, the arrows attached. And here you see uh, a common enough uh, R, this uh, E, when you take off these parts, is, uh, looks like a regular E. The A we can recognize, this is the V, which was used as a U, but it's um, turned into um, an ornament of all of them. First, the unshields. This is um, a page, also from the Book of Kings, which is kept in a small town in Germany, Quedlinburg, and it was written at the end of the 4th or early in the 5th century, written in Rome, in Italy. And it's, as I said, part of the Bible. Unshilos reached the British Isles in 597 when missionaries from Rome, led by St. Augustine of Canterbury and sent by Pope Gregory the Great, came to convert the Anglo Saxons, King Edgar and his people. It's not too far away from here. When you travel to the southeast of Britain, you get to Canterbury, that's here, here about here. So here is Canterbury, and here is Rome, and overland these missionaries traveled to England. People in, on the whole in the Middle Ages traveled huge distances, and scripts went far and wide with them. It's not entirely certain where exactly Latin principles uh, originated in the 4th century, they may have been developed in Northern Africa or in the uh, Greek eastern half of the Mediterranean basin, and their shapes were probably influenced by Greek unshields. Actually, there's one paleographer who has suggested this, that the Roman unshields may be the work of a Roman calligrapher who based his unshield letter forms directly on these Greek unshields. This is the uh, Codex Sinaiticus, a manuscript of the Bible written in the 4th century, before 360. Um, 
It's called the Codex Sinaiticus because it was found in the 19th century in the St. Catherine's Monastery, Homosinti, in Angela. When you look at these uh, Greek letter forms, the uh, uncial A of the Roman uncials is uh, not very different, and the omega, as you see here, when you uh, flip it 180 degrees, you have an uncial M, a Roman M. That is why there, the, the E is the same, the epsilon is the same as the uh, Roman E, and that is why it has been supposed that uh, the Roman uncials are a direct translation of the uh, Greek uncials. Here are what are called English uncials. This is what was made in the British Isles of these uh, Roman uncials. And um, this is in the uh, part of the uh, Codex Aureus, made in Canterbury around 750, a manuscript which is now in the Royal Library in Stockholm, in Sweden. There are differences between the original Roman uncials and the English uncials, and uh, the main one is the pen angle. The pen angle for the Roman uncials is something like 30 degrees, and in these uncials, uh, the pen angle is totally horizontal. And it's a bit more ornate, uh, more elaborated, more detailed than the Roman uncials. They are more direct and a bit more simple. We go back again to the um, Second Bible of Charles the Bald, where the U and the D in Unus de Ra came from, it's now clear. And next we will see how and where the other letter forms and the decoration originate. I told you it's going to be a bit tough, it's a lot of historical <laughs> stuff, and uh, bear with me. When the Angles and Saxons and other peoples in the 3rd century began their push westward on the European continent and later crossed the North Sea to the British Isles. The Celts were driven before them, ending up on the European Atlantic seaboard on the west coast of Scotland, in Ireland, Wales and Brittany and in Galicia. And meanwhile, the Romans would have occupied the British Isles, at least England, uh, had left England, and the Anglo-Saxons intermingled with the remaining inhabitants, Romans as well as Britons. And in their new country, they could find many Roman inscriptions with square capitals. The Celts had their own art. This is a Celtic helmet of bronze with iron and gold, found in northern France, a small town called Amfrevin, and it's now in the Archaeological Museum, National Archaeological Museum in the vicinity of Paris. And it's from the 4th century uh, BC. As ornamentation, you see here swirling lines and spirals, some geometric elements, and a repetition of what look like snail shadows. And otherwise, the Celts often used interlace, cross hatching, as you saw in the uh, manuscript, zoomorphic designs featuring, for example, serpent heads. And this is a painted Celtic vase from a grave near. Brunei, a town not too far removed from the other town, northern France, of the late 4th or early 3rd century BC. It's now in the British Museum. And as you can see, it's decorated with swirling lines and spirals. These are the locations where the helmet and the vase were found, Amphrevi on the left and Brunei on the right. And here are the swirling lines, spirals, wheels, zoomorphic elements, interlace, and geometric decoration in a very famous manuscript, which also features letter forms kept together in a decorative strip, as in the Second Bible of Charles the Bald. You are looking at 
parts of a page of the Lindisfarne rock spots made on the island of Lindisfarne between 715 and 720, some 160 years before the second Bible of Charles the Bald was made. And the Lindisfarne rock spots are one of the absolute treasures of the British Library. You can see in one, it's on display there. In 563, St. Columba, a famous missionary coming from Ireland, which had been Christian for more than a century by that time, founded a monastery on the island of Iona, off the west coast of Scotland. This was followed in 635 by the foundation from Iona of the monastery of Lindisfarne in Northumbria. Jonah on the left, Lindisfarne on the right, very far north in the British Isles. Here is another page of the Lindisfarne Rose Gold with angular letterforms, which are the precursors of some of the exotic letterforms in the Second Bible of Charles the Ball. In the middle, you see in red outlines the word Alpen with a combination of a capital E and a lowercase M attached turned sideways. Uh, what you find in uh, such manuscripts is absolutely amazing creativity and ingenuity of the uh, scribes and illuminators. They would get away with uh, things that if I would propose nowadays <laughs> such solutions to my clients, they would refuse them, I think. <laughs> Same manuscript again. This is the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew. You see here a huge L and an I. Uh, Liber generationis Jesu Christi Filii David Filii Abraham. In the lower right hand corner, you see the Greek phi right over here. This one. And the letters that work into sorry, Abraham, it says, H A M, Abraham. I'm pronouncing it uh, my letter in the Dutch way. <laughs> should try and do it the, uh, the English way. Um, here, you see, for example, an angular U, <coughs> and I will come back to the uh, angular U later on. Many uh, angular platforms. Here is an O. This is a typical uh, Celtic M with a very low diagonal angular S. This is an initial H. This is a, a sort of spiraling G, but with the spiral growing backwards. <laughs> I like it very much. It's a beautiful stuff. And this is an initial from the Second Bible of Charles the Bolivian, which shows you how 160 years later on the European continent, the insular style was interpreted for display capitals. In 1868, a hoard was found near Arda in Ireland which included this chalice. It was made in the 8th century and shows a text underneath the other ornamental band with letter forms similar to those in the Lindisfarne Gospels, now in the National Museum of Ireland in Dublin. Here is a detail of the uh, chalice. You see an angular H and an unshield E, a short triangular stairs. And here is where the, uh, the word was found. This is Arda. The letter forms, such as the angular S or the diamond shaped O you have just seen, were influenced by runes and the organ script. This is a gravestone from Hartlepool. And in the upper programs, you see an alpha which is a descendant of the uh, Roman capital A, as often used in mosaics, and the omega, which looks like the Greek phi. 
In the lower part is written in runes the name of a woman, Hildefrid. And this stone was probably made in the same period as the Lindisfarne process. And here's Hagelkul, which lies just 46 kilometers south of Lindisfarne. And here is a stone with an Ogham inscription. It was originally part of an underground chamber, and the text has been read as Kalu Nobika Maki Mukoi Viteni, but it has not been deciphered. They don't know what it means. Much less is known about the uh, Ogham script than there is about the uh, rules. This uh, stone was discovered in Drumloan, Southern Ireland, and uh, this is where it was found, west of Waterford. Right, you have seen how on the British Isles a mixture was created out of descendants of Roman square capitals, uncials, round forms of angular letters, and insular letter forms, which are angular versions of round letters, like the uh, angular U and the angular S and the diamond shaped O. This mixture was brought to the European continent by missionaries from the British Isles in the late 7th and during the 8th centuries. First, Irish Scottish missionaries, later Anglo Saxons, among them Boniface and Wilbur. They founded monasteries from where the mixture spread all over Europe. From the Second Bible of Charles the Ball, we have traveled back in time to see where and how the three different kinds of letter forms were blended. And now we will travel forward through time, first to see how the blended letter forms reached many parts of Europe in inscriptions during the period 1000 to 1200, and then you will see what happened with the medieval letter forms closer to our own time. Of the medieval inscriptions, you will see three examples. One from Marseille, which is here, and uh, one from Maastricht in the southern part of the uh, Netherlands, and the other dot indicates a small uh, remote place in the Spanish Pyrenees. Okay. Here is the first one. This is from uh, Marseille. I've never seen it in the real. It's still one of my uh, wishes to go down to Marseille to the uh, Abbey of Saint Victor Victoire in uh, there. And it's um, the tombstone for an adult. And um, when you look at the, the size of his head and the size of his feet, he must have been an elongated man. <laughs> very long. But uh, of course, we are very interested in the uh, letter forms, which are uh, fantastic. Um, an angular S that looks like the reverse. Set. Here's another one, but uh, you see the regular as uh, also. Um, nicely ornamented arms, look at this part. Uh, look at the two P's here. It's an amazing combination of uh, platforms. Here is an uh, angular C. What is typical of the inscriptions is that the diagonals of the M never reach the baseline. And there are many details like this. This is one of the more spectacular ones, with, for example, rolled up G's, spiraling G's, and uh, great freedom. And one of the important characteristics is that the distribution of all the different platforms is totally random. There is no system. It has nothing to do with the pronunciation of Latin, which is often supposed. What they loved during this period of the Middle Ages was variation, absolutely variation for its own sake. Um, in the monasteries, it was meant to keep the monks awake. <laughs> they slept short hours, 
and uh, had to do a lot of work on trading during the daytime and then they could drop off. And then you had to read an inscription like this and you were awake again. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, from the uh, southern part of the Netherlands and um, it's not a very well-kept inscription uh, over the uh, main entrance to one of the uh, monastic churches, the cathedral of the monastic. But up there, you see uh, two seas side by side, a round one and uh, an angular one. And uh, here towards the bottom, and I've made an enlargement of it, you see an angular S, which is a rather a rare shape in uh, medieval times. And actually uh, here, you see a very funny letter form, which looks like an O with a tail attached, which is an actual M. And here is a bunch of tea with a nice curl. And then we go briefly to the Spanish Pyrene, where this small church is, with a lengthy inscription above the doorway. Here is a part of it, and we can get a bit closer. And then you see here. A strange metaphor, which is Carolinian, lowercase z. And otherwise, you see letters work into each other. And when you think back of some of the pages of the Lindus Farm Gospels, you see it's very similar. And you wonder whether in this part of Europe, an Irishman uh, has been at work making this inscription. Uh, another feature is that in uh, several places, not this one, you see uh, a is, uh, here is one. This is a V. It's a cut A turned upside down. In 1799, one year before the year 1800, an Englishman by the name of Edmund Fry, who ran a type foundry in London, published his Pantographia, containing accurate copies of all the known alphabets in the world. This is his impression of Carolingian metaphors with some shapes that look like early medieval metaphors. Fry obviously had not seen any actual examples. <laughs> it's a wonderful book. It's, uh, Jerry has a copy. Great to look at, but it's all fantasy. <laughs> in 1865, uh, some uh, 65 years later, was published the Book of Ornamental Alphabets, collected and engraved by Mr. Delamont, who did a much better job than Fry. These are fairly accurate copies of what you can find in the Linux Farmers and similar manuscripts. In the 19th century, many more reliable copies of many of the forms were published. In 1992, Emmy Gray from California published Mason, designed by Jonathan Barnbrook and based on many of the manuscripts. They still have their fascination. And in 1998, Jeremy Tanker published his Alchemy using similar sources. And in 2013, back together, published my Alcumenta, based on the Romanesque interpretations of the early medieval display platforms. In the second line from the top here, you see um, the angular U again. And Again, I ask you, bear with me. Alverata Irregular, which is this version, has been inspired by the medieval mixture of scripts. Several of the angular versions of round platforms and round versions of angular letters have been included, and some new variants have been made, such as the angular lowercase e. How do we do this today? What do we nowadays when different scripts meet? 
they are not mixed, but harmonized, so that they match and can be used side by side. That's the uh, big part of the studies we do here in the uh, brain. Designers look for elements scripts share, as in this case, Rafael Saraiva from Brazil has done with Serendip, a combination of the Sinhala script from Sri Lanka and the Latin script. Both scripts, as you can see, have been very nicely assimilated. Rafael finished his study here in Reading in 2012. A Comparable results is Barbari from 2013 by Bong Min from South Korea with a combination of the Korean and the Latin script. And this is the Asian approach. And where's Aaron? There's Aaron. Now watch this, Aaron. This is the view from the other side. Saya 2011 by Aaron Bell from the United States. Uh, both designers, Bob Min and Aaron, found similar elements in both scripts, and it is striking how close the Latin versions come together while differing very subtly. Uh, I should have a look at Bob Min's work again, look at the Latin, and look at the Latin here. Very nicely differing, but at the same time, I think, under the influence of the Korean script, coming quite close together. Also in 2010-11, Faibar Singh designed his excerpt combining Devanagri and the Latin script. And the Latin script has become somewhat angular. And while this is the Indian approach, <coughs> this is Katari by Aaron Atlantin from the United States, which is even more sharp feature. Katari was designed in 2009 and 10. The angularity in this case brings the Devanagari and the Latin script very close together. This is not just, not really the mixing of scripts as the medieval scribes and the humanist practice, but it's not too far off. Find one element that both scripts can share and bring them very close together. Ben Jones, is he in the room? I think so. Where's Ben? Ah, oh, there's Ben. Hello, Ben. Um, you designed your embers to make the Latin version work well together with several other scripts. Here, angularity and a distinct movement in the first part form, I think, an attractive basis for the cooperation between different scripts. With this approach and those you saw before, scripts sort of bow elegantly to each other. At last, I come back to the angular view, and something has gone totally wrong here. Uh, it's, um, you have to go back very quickly to this, here. Yeah, look at the angular view here. You were meant to see it very, very big. Um, everything was okay when I checked my PDF this morning. Why you get this view? I have no idea. Ignore it. <laughs> Earlier this year, Alvarata received gold in the European Design Awards in Istanbul. And I traveled there to pick up the prize. The blurred image shows you how excited I was when I realized <laughs> that in Turkey too, the angular U is known and you. <laughs> Thank you very much.